The word fandom means a celebration and camaraderie of individuals who share a similar interest, or simply put, a community of diehard fans. The subject of these groups can range from all sorts of media. Doctor Who, Pokemon, Star Wars, Harry Potter, the list just goes on and on. Some of these titles are extremely popular and are world-renowned. Others, however, are not as fortunate and are rejected because of their strange behavior. In fall 2010, a group such as this emerged. Born from the internet, these fans burned a trail through the web and quickly became an online phenomenon, and they go by the name of Bronies. Older male fans of the show, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. These people might sound strange, and that's because, well, they are strange. Nothing like this has ever happened before, or at least on this level. It confuses social logic and throws mainstream society for a loop. Men are held to a high standard, and to see them enjoying something so feminine and childish is quite bizarre and is even semi-threatening to some people. But just like other parts of geek culture, appearances can be deceiving. The rabbit trail goes deeper than you think. And we're going to explore every inch of it, from the origins to the community, to the social science, and through dozens of interviews with Milo Pony fans. No detail will be spared as we explore the series of events that have led up to the Bernie fandom that exists today, a group of fans who inadvertently challenge established social norms. This is their journey. This is their story. <laughs> The beginning of our tale is one that dates all the way back to the early 1920s, many decades before the Milo Pony franchise even existed. A small company at the time that went by the name of Hassenfield Brothers manufactured simple pencil cases and school supplies. 30 years later, the business switched up its production and created its first unique toy, Mr. Potato Head. It was a smash hit and opened the door for the budding enterprise, which eventually changed its name to Hasbro. Another successful franchise soon followed that called itself G.I. Joe. As a matter of fact, it was this line of toys that coined the phrase action figure in order to toughen up its doll-like image and look more appealing to boys. It was a very effective strategy as Hasbro was quickly learning the ins and outs of its consumers and their respective demographics. In the 1980s, Hasbro picked up momentum with the launch of two powerhouse series that still remain popular to this day, Transformers and My Little Pony. Both went on to become worldwide phenomenons and became very successful with their targeted audiences. Young boys would play with their Optimus Prime toys while little girls would brush the manes of their plastic ponies. That was the norm. However, this wouldn't always be the case for My Little Pony, as it, thanks to a crazy series of events, 
ended up with a sizable demographic that no one expected. Yet this didn't happen until almost 30 years after the creation of MLP. For it was then, in the early 1980s, where My Little Pony officially began. The development of the franchise is all due to the initial idea and toy designs of Bonnie Zacharel, the original creator of My Little Pony. Her inspiration for the series stems all the way back to her childhood, when she was just a little girl living in Japan. Her father was an army veterinarian who worked at a compound for animals. She spent a lot of her days there with the pony, and over time grew close to it. The family eventually had to move away from Japan, and they were unable to take Bonnie's pet with them. She begged her father for another pony at their new home but he persuaded her otherwise. The amount of work required for its upkeep would cut into every facet of Bonnie's life, such as having a job, school, and friends. She took her dad's advice, though she never gave up on the dream of one day having her own pony. Years later, this sparked an idea. Bonnie thought that if she couldn't have a real pony, then why not have the next best thing, a toy pony? She drew up designs for the concept and dubbed it My Pretty Pony. At first, the toys were bulky, and had bland colors. Then again, Bonnie intended this, because that made the toys more accurate to actual ponies. After making some alterations that were suggested by Hasbro, the final product was complete, and the title for the franchise was changed to My Little Pony. Hasbro approved and bought the rights to Bonnie's creation. It soon became a huge success, and was extremely popular among young females everywhere. From the beginning, MLP had a feminine tone and audience in mind. This is something that Hasbro recognized and established on. It worked for G.I. Joe and young boys in the past, and they knew that My Little Pony was going to work just as effectively on little girls in the 1980s. Different genders, different franchises. So began a marketing technique that remains strong to this very day. But Hasbro is just one of many companies that reinforce the idea of boys and girls sticking to their own types of toys. To be honest, these results are just a byproduct of corporations trying to market to an existing audience and what they like. This is what we call the Pink Blue Syndrome, and it has been highly prominent in the My Little Pony series since its creation, and is also the main reason why bronies are such an unusual phenomenon. Go to any toy aisle at any store. What colors jump out to you? Pink and blue, of course. And what do these colors indicate? The boy toys from the girl toys. The guys will stand around their aisle checking out Star Wars toys, Nerf guns, and Hot Wheel cars. The female section, on the other hand, will be filled with Barbie dolls, Littlest Pet Shop, and My Little Pony. This is something people in modern society are used to, but rarely consciously realize. So one can see why it's odd. When an older male is looking for that Rainbow Dash toy in the pink aisle, it's a violation of a social norm and sets off a red flag in our mind. We then register that individual as a deviant and assume the worst in him. This is the cornerstone of our case study, and it will be explained in more detail as we continue on. For the time being, we'll focus on the history of the series and how it secured a social medium over the course of the next three decades. When it comes to My Little Pony, there are two different timelines, one for the toys and one for the cartoons. For this case study, we will focus on the latter. Now, I know you might be thinking that this is a tad excessive talking about the past generations of the show, but it's actually the opposite. For almost 30 years, My Little Pony has been catered towards younger females, and mainstream society has gotten used to that notion. We need to analyze what kind of ideas were firmly established over that time period, and how it contributed to the social norm that we are questioning today. My Little Pony, as a franchise, was created in 1981, but the actual animations didn't show up until 1984. Its first appearance was a standalone TV special called Rescue at Midnight Castle. Hasbro wanted to test the waters and see how their audience would receive the show. Well, the feedback must have been positive, because another special showed up a year later called Escape from Katrina. Both episodes confirmed what Hasbro was hoping for, and that is little girls who are infatuated by little ponies. So what better way to satisfy their demand than to make a feature-length film for the big screen? Well, Hasbro, at least you tried. 
The movie was a flop and tanked in ticket sales. The critics weren't too kind either and saw little to no redeeming value in the film. To them, it was just a glorified hour-long commercial about buying My Little Pony toys. Despite the setback at the box office, Hasbro was not deterred and knew that they could still make this franchise work. In 1986, MLP reappeared on television, but this time as an actual series. It was called My Little Pony and Friends, and it was just as successful as the previous television specials. It sported the same cast, the same setting, the same everything, and little girls fell in love with it all over again. So I bet you all are thinking, <laughs> this show has got to be lame. I mean, pff, come on! Talking, pink ponies. I bet they had tea parties and played Pretty Pretty Princess all the time. Am I right, fellas? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, surprisingly not. Albeit the series had its moments of extreme prissiness, they had some pretty nasty monsters show up now and then to challenge the ponies. Tyrik, a demonic centaur who wished to enslave all the ponies and transform them into monsters. The Schmooze, a gelatinous blob that would overwhelm the lands of Ponyville, spreading malice and hatred everywhere. There were even Southerners in the show. Generation 1 legitimately fell under the action slash fantasy genre. It actually wasn't that rare to see the occasional boy watch the show. Regardless of its adventurous stories and settings, G1 lacked in one major department. Characters. Many of the ponies of Generation 1 were flat and had generic personality traits. Out of all the characters in the show, only a handful stood out from the crowd, as the rest kind of blended together and usually acted the exact same way. That was fun! Where ball? Baby wasn't any ball. Baby was... Imagination. Imagination? Imagination. Yet this was all about to change in a drastic way. My Little Pony and Friends ended in 87, and five years later, the cartoon went through a transformation. In 1992, MLP returned to television with a new series called My Little Pony Tales. Along with the new title came some other changes. Let's compare and control Hold on a minute. Are they walking? Are they in school? Are those leg warmers? Wait, when was this released again? Ah, okay. Now it makes much more sense. <laughs> it could be worse. They could be wearing tight blue jeans and have their hair all fuzzed up. I spoke too soon. Right off the bat, you can tell that MLP was going in a very different direction compared to the last series. They switched the genre of the show from adventure and fantasy to more of a slice of life setting. But why? Well, it has been about five years since the show was on the air, and a lot of those girls who watched it before have grown up. They needed something to relate to, and Hasbro was on it. <laughs> This really was a drastic change for the franchise, and in two big ways. First, they narrowed their sights onto the female demographic way more than the first series. Next, they slightly altered the target of the audience's age group. I mean, let's be real here. How many little girls between the ages of 5 to 9 have relationship issues with guys? Besides their brothers picking on them? Probably none! These were stories that paralleled with the issues pre-teen girls would be going through, like school, relationships with friends, and having boy problems. Yet in its defense, what My Little Pony Tales lacked in settings and plots, it made up for in characters. Oddly enough, the show did a decent job in giving the ponies distinctive traits that set them apart from each other. Melody wanted to be a rock star, Patches was a goofball, and Bon Bon loved to bake and eat food. Compared to My Little Pony and Friends, this was an improvement though it did not save the show from its cliché storylines. Despite the changes made to the series, it was not as successful as its predecessor and came to a close in winter of 1992. This officially brought the first generation of My Little Pony cartoons to a close. For the next decade, the animated portion of the franchise would be a hiatus. In 2003, My Little Pony returned from the grave. It was gone for so long that it missed an entire generation. Now, the previous two series represent the first time period of My Little Pony's history, though some confuse My Little Pony Tales as the second generation. Nope, there wasn't a second generation for the cartoon. Hasbro decided to hold on and reboot the animated portion of the franchise alongside the toys, which was a good idea, 
since the G2 toys weren't doing so well at the time. But man, it's been over a decade since we last saw the show. I wonder what changed. <sighs> Apparently a lot. Generation 3, also known as G3, was somewhat of a hybrid of the previous two formulas for MLP. They took elements from each series and combined them into a new but somewhat familiar setting for the ponies to play in. The modern city scene was traded in for a fantasy world, but this time around, there were no more goblins or witches. Instead, it was nothing but sweet and kind magical creatures. The stories focused mainly about the ponies going to parties or pretending to be princesses. Stories that, at their core, are simple, and hold little interest to anyone who isn't a 3-7 to seven year old female. Come on and dance with us! It's lots of fun! Yeah! Got your special dancing shoes on? No? Did you look under your bed? <laughs> Dude, that's creepy. Unlike G1, Generation 3 was direct-to-home movie, with the occasional TV special. It also had three different series within it. The first batch had its characters look somewhat similar to the ponies in G1, though the style looked a bit sleeker due to advancements in computer animation. Next, there were the chibi ponies. They had big heads, arms, and eyes, but had little torsos. The last part of Generation 3 was the newborn cuties. A majority of fans consider this rock bottom for the franchise. Hasbro was now just trying to put shiny objects on the screen for infants to stare at. The characters were extremely simple, and so were the stories. The animation was minimal and it became painfully obvious that Hasbro had clearly lost sight of any kind of creative direction the show could have possessed. I mean, Generation 1, and even a little bit of 3, had some substance to it, but Newborn Cuties was just straight up toddler fodder. It was sad to see the series dissolve to this point. Party? Party, 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 party! Party, 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 party! <sighs> It's easy to criticize a children's show and bash it for not having incredible stories, in-depth characters, or mind-blowing animation. G3 wasn't trying to be any of that. All it was concerned with was entertaining its young female audience just enough to convince them to go out and buy Hasbro's toys. That's about it. If you expected anything else, well, you're going to be let down. After three decades, it was quite clear what My Little Pony had become and who it was for. There is a stigma that follows female entertainment and that is girly equals lame. If it ain't blue and packing 50 caliber sniper rounds with armor penetrating capabilities, then what respective male would have anything to do with it? You can keep your dolls to yourself. This part of the industry is mostly looked down upon, and it's that kind of thinking that creates these stereotypes in the first place. Because there's prejudice against girl entertainment, it has suffered in quality, and rarely has anything redeeming for its viewers to take away. Just the same old pink princess story over and over again. But this isn't necessarily an absolute, and one company proves that on a colossal scale. Disney. Pick a movie, any movie. The Little Mermaid, Mulan, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King. Each one of these flicks are loved by people from every walk in life, regardless of age or gender. Walt said it best himself, and I quote, You're dead if you aim only for kids. Adults are only kids grown up anyway. So these movies end up being entertaining for everyone, because they were well made. Quality doesn't belong to a single demographic. If people have the passion, drive, and vision to create, then that final product will show it regardless if it's pink or blue. This is the cause of our current situation. For almost 30 years, we looked at My Little Pony as a show just for little girls and nothing more. That was the impression we were given and thoroughly believed. But in 2010, all of our assumptions were about to be put to the test. Following a two-year hiatus from G3, My Little Pony returned and brought with it a surprise that no one expected. The franchise was about to go through its greatest change yet. In 2010, Hasbro teamed up with Discovery Communications to create a new channel to replace Discovery Kids. Between the two, they pulled their resources 
and the final product was the hub. The hub needed a starting lineup of shows for the launch of the channel. Plans were being made, and a roster eventually surfaced. Franchises, such as Transformers, Strawberry Shortcake, and Pound Puppies, were featured, and so was, you guessed it, My Little Pony. Now came the fun part of figuring out who would take charge of this new generation of the series, and let me tell you, they struck gold with their decision. It just so happened around that time that Lauren Faust, the future creative head of Generation 4, was on the hunt to get her own show off the ground. So she decided to stop by Hasbro on the hub to pitch her idea, Milky Way and the Galaxy Girls. Unfortunately, it wasn't picked up by the network, yet she was given another offer. Lisa Lich, who was the Hasbro representative speaking to Lauren at the time, knew that they were in need of a person to take charge of the new generation of My Little Pony, and to pass up on Lauren would have been extremely foolish. I mean, have you seen this woman's track record? She was a driving force behind some incredibly well-made shows, but the two that speak loudest of her talent would have to be Powerpuff Girls and Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Now, a lot of people think that she came up with both of these cartoons on her own, but let's give credit where credit is due. It was actually her husband, Craig McCracken, who thought up of the ideas for the two shows. Nevertheless, Lauren played a huge role in the success for Foster's and Powerpuff Girls alike. She has a knack for storytelling and a passion for creating quality entertainment. So when Lisa pulled out some of the old Generation 3 movies and asked Lauren if she could fix it, well, that's like asking a brain surgeon to put a band-aid on a scraped knee. But there's more of a reason for Lauren to say yes than to simply claim the spot of creative Stewart. As a child, she grew up with the franchise and was no stranger to Generation 1. Lauren has mentioned during interviews and panels that she would imagine her own scenarios for the ponies to go on, adventures that would bring the characters to life and give them more personality. Needless to say, she held on to those memories and now it was her chance to bring both her childhood dreams and My Little Pony back to life. Lauren said yes to the offer and went straight to work. When it comes to creating a show, the first step is the pitch bible. It's basically a summarized version of what the series would look and feel like. Elements, such as the setting, animation, and storytelling are established in a rough cut and then presented for Hasbro to see. With the budget that Lauren was given for the pitch bible, she hired two colleagues to help her with the early stages of the project, Martin Angelo Bahir and Paul Rudish. Martin drew some of the initial background concepts, and Paul helped with conceptualization and art development. In fact, it was Paul who drew the sketches that inspired the idea of Pegasi controlling the weather. All of them did art for the pitch, but it was Lauren who came up with the character designs for the main cast, and also the initial storyline for the show. Over time, the team established all the basics the show would need. Location, characters, world dynamics, all were in order. Now came the critical step of finding a studio to create the series. At this point, the pitch bible was approved by Hasbro, and now Lauren had to decide on a production studio for My Little Pony. After interviewing several candidates, Hasbro suggested Studio B of Vancouver, Canada, which is currently known as DHX. Lauren liked what she saw and took notice of the illustrators and their ability to draw fluid four-legged creatures with flash animation. And rightfully so, too. DHX has had plenty of practice with their previous shows, such as Puka and Martha Speaks. If picked, it would be their jobs to provide the storyboards and structure for each episode of the series. The studio pitched their services, but only under the condition that Jason Thiessen would be the supervising director. Lauren agreed and went to work with Jason and co-director James Woody Wooten as they put together a two-minute animated short of what the show would look like. The animation impressed Hasbro, and they gave the full green light for the series to be produced by DHX. With Lauren at lead and a talented studio at her command, the future of My Little Pony was looking bright, but she still needed a few more positions filled before the entire team was complete. In LA, Lauren and the story editor for the staff, Robin Zetti, worked together with the writing crew to start the script process for the show. Lauren handpicked her writing portion of the team, most of whom she worked with in the past on shows like Powerpuff Girls and Fosters. Such writers included Cindy Morrow, Megan McCarthy, Emmy Larson, and Amy Keaton Rogers. The ideas for each episode were created by Lauren and Rob, and then they issued those stories out for the writers to expand the story on. Throughout the entire phase, Lauren overlooked the writing process with Rob and made tweaks here and there, yet Hasbro held the final mark of approval for the scripts. It's worth mentioning that the show had to follow educational levels because of its target audience. Trying to make a plot entertaining without coming across as predictable or generic can be difficult. Yet these storytellers were some of the best in the business. They overcame these obstacles and were able to have their cake and eat it. Another outstanding and very popular aspect of the show is music. And we have three talented gentlemen to thank for that. Daniel Ingram, William Anderson, and Stefan Andrews. Every so often, 
A writer will want a song in an episode. They will write out some rough lyrics and then pass it along to Daniel and Stefan to expand and improve on. The lyrical portion of the job falls upon Daniel, as he is the one who fine-tunes the words for flow. Stefan then provides the orchestration that goes along with the lyrics of the song. The two are a team, and together they have churned up some amazing pieces of work. Into the gala, now's the time we're ready and we look divine. Into the gala, meet new friends. Into the gala, sell some apples. Into the gala, find my prince. Prove I'm great as a wonder bolt. Do you need to sell, to find, to prove, to woo, to talk. Into the gala, into the gala. William, on the other hand, is the man who fills in the rest of the gaps. He provides the original background score for the show, which ranges from casual and calm melodies to heavy rock and roll. This is a part of the cartoon that never had to truly exist, or at least be well done. But Lauren wanted this generation to be more than just a glorified commercial to sell toys. All of these songs are an indication of a team who is willing to go above and beyond the call of duty to make a quality show. And the numbers from YouTube prove that. Winter Wrap Up, a song that was about the ponies cleaning up their town to make way for spring. Views on YouTube, over a million. Smile Song, Pinkie Pie serenades us with her voice as she sings about her love of smiling and bringing cheer to the lives of those around her. Views on YouTube, over 3 million. This Day Aria. The wedding of Princess Cadence is in jeopardy due to the evil deeds of Queen Chrysalis. Both belt out some vocals and share with the audience their true feelings for shining armor. Views on YouTube, over 14 million. If that isn't a sign of a team who does their job well, then I don't know what is. It got to the point in production where voice actors were needed for the characters of the show. And Lauren wasn't just about to throw any willy-nilly person into a role. She wanted heart. She wanted charisma. She wanted people who can bring a character to life. And that is exactly what she got. The first character on the roster was Twilight Sparkle. She is, well, was a unicorn who was sent to Ponyville by Princess Celestia in order to learn more about friendship. Twilight is well-organized and intelligent. Pretty much a bookworm. This is the first story in the series. I own all of them. And is one of the best when it comes to magic. She's also quite the worry wart, as her anxiety has gotten the best of her on more than one occasion. Heck, there are times when she's gone full-blown insane. <laughs> hi, girls! Oh, hi, Twilight. How's it going? Great. Just great. A character like this would require the voice of someone who is equally as crazy, and that person was voice actor Tara Strong. Tara has quite the impressive resume, and has been in shows such as Teen Titans, Powerpuff Girls, Fairly Odd Parents, and many, many more. She is definitely an A-lister, and a seasoned veteran in the voice acting industry. Originally, Lauren had planned to have Tara voice a character of Pinkie Pie, but after hearing her recite some Twilight Sparkle lines, Lauren was convinced that Tara would be perfect for the role. Next was the character of Rarity. At first glance, one would think that this is your typical diva unicorn. The foo-foo, two-dimensional fashionista who had little to no traits beyond looking beautiful among her friends. Well, you're wrong. Take that, you ruffian! Believe it or not, Rarity has some depth to her. I mean, sure, she loves fashion and can be overly formal. A contest at Sweet Apple Acres? It doesn't sound very clean. But this won't stop her from getting her hooves dirty if the situation calls for it. Fighting's not really my thing. I'm more into fashion. But I'll rip you to pieces if you touch one scale on his cute little head! This is a gal who understands the importance of generosity and putting loved ones first. Refined but sincere, there is more to this pony than meets the eye. And it was voice actor Tabitha St. Germain who provided the special spark that this character required. Tabitha has been involved in voice acting since 1985 and has appeared in a ton of cartoons. Seriously, the list is huge. Oh, and by the way, she also voiced a few of the ponies from Generation 3. Awkward. The next two characters are as different as day and night. One is shy and timid, while the other is loud and outgoing. Fluttershy and Pinkie Pie. 
Fluttershy is a pegasus with a love for her friends and animals. Don't get me started on the fauna. There's loons and toucans and bitterns, oh my! She is sweet and has a soft voice. It's called the Alicorn Amulet, and whoever wears it is blessed with unto Hey, every pony, look! This book has a picture of Trixie's necklace! And tries to spread kindness to everyone around her. But don't get on her bad side. She can have quite the surprising temper if you put her in a grumpy mood. I said... Pinkie Pie is the opposite, as she prefers to be out and about, making other ponies laugh and smile through her quirky but funny antics. Oh, I never leave home without my party cannon! <laughs> yeah, she can be overbearing at times, but it's all in good fun. <laughs> Unless you don't like her jokes, and then she goes psycho. No, you're not understanding me! I want you to come back! Despite the contrasting character, Fluttershy and Pinkie Pie are both voiced by the same person, Miss Andrea Libman. She has been in the VA business since she was a young child. Some of her earlier shows include Dragon Ball, Dragon Tales, Reboot, and Madeline. Oh, and guess what? She too was a voice for one of the ponies from Generation 3. Oh. My. I feel a trend coming on. The last two main characters on the show are Applejack and Rainbow Dash. Two ponies who have an appreciation for roughhousing, athletics, and competition. Applejack works at her family farm, planting and harvesting apples for the hungry mouths of Ponyville. She's diligent, caring, basically the big sister of the group, who tends to keep a level head during high-strung situations. Hold on! I'm a-coming! She has been known, however, to overexert herself and turn down help because of her sense of pride. Are you saying my mouth is making promises my legs can't keep? Yep. Applejack would rather take on a problem all on her own than ask for help from her friends. How many times do I gotta say it? I don't need no help from no pony! Rainbow Dash is not as level-headed as her earthbound compadre. She's brash, a little reckless, but has a good heart. <coughs> Sorry, new trick. She will stay loyal to her friends no matter the situation. That was awesome! Awesome? My friends could have been smashed to pieces. And rise to any challenge. Dragons, manticores, <laughs> bring forth a true opponent! <laughs> Never mind. Just like Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy, both Applejack and Rainbow Dash are voiced by the same actor, Ashley Ball. Unlike the other VAs mentioned before, Ashley's relatively new to the industry, but she has had her own fair share of parts to play. Johnny Tess, Strawberry Shortcake, and of course My Little Pony. Also, it's worth mentioning that she has her own band called Hey Ocean, so she isn't just a voice actor, but a singer too. That is it for the main pony cast, but we cannot forget to mention Twilight's faithful assistant, Spike the Dragon. I'm a dragon! Spike lives with Twilight at the library and does chores. Cleaning, cooking, delivery. He's basically a butler. A butler with a bedtime. Because I can just stay up all night and finish. But he's more than just a servant. Twilight and Spike share a brother and sister relationship. She watches out for him, and he watches out for her. He can be sarcastic at times, and a bit full of himself, too. That is why you are my number one assistant. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. But he's an overall nice guy who truly cares for his pony family. Despite being a dude, Spike is actually voiced by a woman. And that would be the talented Kathy Westlock. She has been voice acting since 1986, and has been involved in over 100 shows. Some of the more notable ones include Black Lagoon, Cyber 6, Dragon Ball Z, and a slew of other English dub animes. She is also an experienced voice instructor and director. Wait a second. She was a part of G3 as well? And My Little Pony Tales? Huh, how about that? But these are just five of the many talented VAs who work on the show. Others include Andrew Francis, Lee Tokar, Nicole Oliver, Peter New, Brenda Critchlow, Michelle Krieber, Clara Corlett, and Maddie Peters. Each one does a phenomenal job as they bring to life their characters in a unique and vivid way. Unlike G1 and G3, Lauren wanted the fourth generation of My Little Pony to have a diverse cast. Ponies who have different personalities, strengths, and weaknesses. In return, they would have to lean and depend on each other. And that makes for fantastic storytelling, which is arguably the most appealing aspect of the show. My Little Pony was nearing completion, and the Hub's marketing team was hard at work trying to promote all their new shows for the channel's launch. MLP was popping up on billboards and posters, and eventually made its way to the internet. The chatter about the reboot for the series was relatively small, and remained that way until the show made its debut, 
on October 10th, 2010. After months of hard work around the clock, the cartoon was complete and was ready to be shown to the world. All that time, all that effort, everything that Lauren had envisioned and hoped for was about to be put to the test. She was prepared to face the critics for better or worse and to see where this generation of the series would take her. But what ended up happening was something no one saw coming, and that was the rise of the Brony. Reviews were popping up all over the web, and were giving their opinion about the new generation of My Little Pony. Some were positive, and stated that the show was entertaining and fun for parents and their kids. Others, though, were harder to impress, and some were just downright insulting. Take Kathleen Richter, writer for Ms. Magazine, for example. She wrote an article for her site about MLP called, My Little Homophobic, Racist, Smart Shamming Pony. Needless to say, she did not think very highly of the cartoon, and thought it to be racist, sexist, and had little to no redeeming value with the lessons the show taught. Lauren actually responded to this article, and said that Kathleen was overanalyzing, and assuming way too much. And apparently, Kathleen had never even watched an actual episode of the show. She based it on a clip, and wrote her article from that alone. As Lauren said, give the entire show a chance, and you may be pleasantly surprised. Unlike Kathleen, many other people gave MLP a fair shot and discovered that the cartoon was fantastic. Their expectations were surpassed, and the curse that followed My Little Pony for so long was finally lifted. All of the hard work from Lauren and her team paid off, and they brought life to a franchise that was void of creativity. Yet this wasn't the only thing they brought life to. Strangely enough, the majority of the approval for Generation 4 did not come from children or their parents. It was from older teenagers and 20-year-olds, and most of them were guys. To Lauren's surprise, the show was so well made and entertaining that it ended up being admired by a group of most unexpected fans. When it first, My Little Pony, when it first started in the 80s, it really was about, you know, we're going to hawk this merchandise to kids. And if you watch Friendship is Magic, you don't really get that vibe at all. And that's, that's really cool that they felt that they should step up their game and put the effort in when they really didn't have to. It was gonna, you know, the little girls were gonna buy the toys either way. It's a show about colorful ponies, made for, meant for, you know, little girls, and yet everyone in this community is watching it. You know, it has to be something really special in order for it to catch this, this much attention, you know. Since its creation, the My Little Pony franchise has always had young girls in mind, but that was no longer the case. Generation 4 was able to catch the attention of this unlikely group of older fans. Being an old school comic book cartoon guy, um, I was immediately drawn by the animation, which was much better. In fact, I didn't even know it was Flash until someone told me that's Flash. Was, Flash, really? And I know it seems, I mean, so many people say, oh, the animation is great, but it really is, especially when you consider that this is Flash animation and just the amount of tender love and care that they put into really making these characters emote. And when the characters emote, we care. And when we care, then we get invested. And I think that's, that's, that can be really hard to pull off with that kind of medium. I was very impressed by the fact that they adopted very realistic movement for the characters into stylized proportions. Um, I was very impressed with how smooth it was, how balanced it was. The animation was fantastic. The way the characters moved, the emotions, uh, the, the ability to kind of express so much in terms of storytelling just through the characters and how they're interacting before our eyes. I was initially struck, struck by the animation, I think is what is pretty common. Everyone says, I mean, because you see common, like when you realize later the people who worked on it, you see the common threads and you go, oh, that's why I like it. Animation wasn't the show's only strong point, as it had equally excellent storytelling that was appealing to the entire audience. I don't know, I think mostly it's just the sense of humor and the, the how clever it is that really keeps me hooked. You know, the season one, it was, just, it was just so tight. The dialogue was tight, the character interaction was really just like, everything was just so well-groomed and well-placed, and it's just, it's just so clever. 
You know, it's not like, it's not banging you over the head with how funny it's trying to be. It just ends up being funny because it's good. It looks just like yours. Oh my, that nest needs to be condemned. Oh, Spike, it's not so bad. Uh, maybe the birds can use it as a, an outhouse. When you watch, you get the sense of everyone's having fun. Um, you can get that everyone who makes the show cares. There's quality in it that is part of the show. And it's just, you feel like there's an interaction between you and the show, especially when they're putting in Easter eggs here or there. And, and then when you get to talk to everyone in the community after watching the show, and then you find out all the stuff you missed, all the references and everything. It's, uh, there's so much about the show that is so much fun. Um, it's hard to really boil it down to one thing, but I love the interaction that they have between the viewers and the show. It's always fun to, to see what sort of interesting references they put in there. I think that draws a, a, a big audience. I know that I sat my mother down and we watched it at one point and she caught the Gone with the Wind uh, reference that Rarity makes. Hey, Celestia is my witness. I shall never be sisterless again. You know, that put a smile on her face. Also the I Love Lucy. Uh, little sketch that they uh, that they did in the last roundup, and it's little things like that though that are kind of like the icing on the top and really make it just such a joy to watch. The characters in Friendship Is Magic were neither shallow nor two dimensional, but actually had substance to them. The, 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 there are lots of very good characters. They're well written and uh, and they're diverse, uh, and you can find at least little bits of each of them in yourself. The characters really appealed to me because they're also likable. Like they're realistic. Like I've known people in high school. Like oh Rarity, you're why you act like that? Oh Twilight, you why you always got to study? Oh Applejack, oh you always got to work? I've known people like that, especially a shy one like Fluttershy. I, I kind of was like that. Regardless of the reasons listed, the fact remained. This generation of My Little Pony was genuinely good, and that came as a shock to many of these older viewers. I, I babysit kids who saw the G3 thing. That was just brain painful. And like my niece used to watch that, and the Princess Promenade, I was just like, what is this? What is this? I will never ever watch this stuff. And then little did I know, one year later, God, I love this stuff. Maybe, you know, maybe it has a charm that can't really be described. Maybe it's better than the sum of its parts. Maybe it's because we have preconceived notions about what My Little Pony is supposed to be, which is to say, a cartoon that does nothing but sell toys. And the fact that we're getting something that's more than that at all is what makes us enjoy it. It's a good pick-me-up and just kind of helps balance out like the pressures of normal life to just kind of, you know, every Saturday you get 22 minutes of just like good feeling and nothing's gonna mess that up. Despite the show's success, not every person shared the same sentiment for this new series of My Little Pony. There were even some who believed that Friendship is Magic was a sign of decay in the animation industry. Author Minda Mindy of CartoonBrew.com made this claim in his article that was titled The End of the Creative Driven Era, a mid-sadness review that My Little Pony was an indicator that cartoons were officially on the decline and were selling out in order to make toys and money. That any passion that was left in modern day cartoons had disappeared due to weak production staffs and controlling companies. Such wild accusations about the show and cartoons in general really worried some users of a certain website, the code board from 4chan. All the hype and chatter about this article and the cartoon in question found its way over to Co, where it then became very popular. 4chan, for those who don't know, is a notorious image board website that has been around since 2003. It was created by a fellow named Christopher Moot Pool. The site has over 48 boards with various topics like anime and video games. The site is incredibly popular and has quite the reputation on the internet for being rude, harsh, and raw. When it comes to 4chan, anybody can quite literally say anything and for the most part not worry about the repercussions since they appear as anonymous. Some 4chan users have been acknowledged as hackers, and this is semi-true. It isn't too uncommon to see raiding parties on other targeted websites. It's a metaphorical double-edged sword, and one that has been swung towards both extremes. On one end, they have hacked corporate and government websites, and on the other hand, they have tracked down and reported child pornography enthusiasts and producers to the FBI. 4chaners are sporadic, and it's quite difficult to pin down their precise motives. The site has also had quite the impact on internet culture. Many a meme and online joke can be traced back to the image board as the place of origin. This is the case for a lot of familiar internet icons, such as Lolcats, Rick Rolling, and in our case, My Little Pony. Despite its dark side, 4chan is an extremely impressive website. It is a testament to the power of coordination and the strength of numbers rallied via the internet. 
the site has left its mark on cyberspace and has earned a spot in the Internet Hall of Fame. The reputation of 4chan precedes it, and is definitely alive and well today. It can be cruel, it can be harsh, and it can be downright insulting. Yet this was the playing field for the first batch of fans for My Little Pony. Here, they took their first steps towards becoming an online phenomenon. Ko, which is a comic and cartoon board of 4chan, had heard about My Little Pony prior to its premiere. The threads were few in number, and only had a handful of users discussing the new generation of ponies. Some had faith in the series, while others dismissed it as another mindless kid show. Expectations were pretty low overall, but when the first episode made its debut on October 10, 2010, the users of Ko were pleasantly surprised. This generation of My Little Pony was nothing like its previous counterparts. It could actually hold up on its own, and was entertaining to watch. More and more people on the board decided to give G4 a chance, and ended up liking it. Over a week following the premiere, Ko discovered the article about My Little Pony from Cartoon Brew. Needless to say, the accusations from the writer startled some of the 4chan users. Could this show really be the beginning of the end for cartoons? Is Friendship is Magic just another series that is void of creativity and only cares about selling toys? I'm Pinkie Pie! Hop on my train! My Little Pony! Tough, but fair questions. The franchise doesn't necessarily have the best track record. Yet fans of the show from Ko jumped to its defense and claimed that the new My Little Pony was actually well done and was nothing like what the article said. All this hype and fighting, though, drew in more people who decided to see what the commotion was about and watch the show with their own eyes. And just like the earlier fans on Ko, these viewers too liked what they saw. They discovered that this generation of My Little Pony was pretty good and wasn't just some kids show with an agenda to only sell toys. It had quality and that earned the attention and admiration of Ko. Following Amid's article, My Little Pony threads started to pick up in momentum as thousands of posts poured into 4chan on a daily basis that discussed about the series and the universe surrounding it. This was quite bizarre, even by 4chan standards, but there it was! Older male fans talking about pink ponies. For almost 30 years, the MLP franchise was primarily enjoyed by little girls, but thanks to Ko, everything had just drastically changed. This is where the Bernie fandom officially got its start as a demographic and group, though they were not referred to as bronies right off the bat. The origin of the word and the initial meaning behind it can be difficult to trace. The one that makes the most sense, and actually has some kind of documentation, is simply a play on the words bro plus pony. This here is the earliest evidence of foreign channels using the word brony, and it just so happened that it stuck. In time, My Little Pony and the budding fanbase found their way over to the roughest part of 4chan. B, or also known as the Random Board. Now when it comes to 4chan's notorious reputation, you don't have to look any further than B. The anons who visit this particular section of the site are known for posting some of the nastiest stuff on the web, and their attitudes aren't much better. Porn, gore, offensive language, no subject is off limits to this board, as it thrives on its uncensored and disturbing nature. So you could only imagine the look on their faces when adorable pink ponies started to invade their turf by the thousands. Ko was overflowing with pony-related threads, and it was only a matter of time until MLP expanded onto the other boards of 4chan. At first, B didn't know how to react to the situation. Some of the users genuinely liked the show, but the majority didn't care for it at all. Yet it was the gradual oversaturation of ponies on their board that led many of them to absolutely hate My Little Pony and its intrusive fans. What started as a trickle turned into a flooding river as My Little Pony content soared in traffic. It got to the point where any legitimate discussions about the show dissolved into mindless macro image threads and spam posts that only antagonized the non-MLP users of B and Co. The opponents of these overzealous bronies would then retaliate by polluting pony threads with perverted content of their own. Both sides went back and forth for a few months as the situation continued to spiral out of control. It finally reached the point where a full-on ban was brought down on any thread that discussed My Little Pony. The mods of 4chan had finally had enough and could no longer deal with the surge of pony content. This ban officially started on February 26, 2011. Unfortunately, this was enforced on every MLP fan, and that also included those who tried to stay out of the flame war. Nevertheless, all were punished and were no longer allowed to discuss the show on 4chan. Even saying the word pony was against the rules, but in a way, this was a blessing in disguise. 
the band created a need for Bernies to go out into the web and find a place to call their own. There were already Bernie sites that existed prior to the bands on 4chan, but none of them were as popular at the time as Co and B were when it came to My Little Pony. This was starting to change though, and the bands actually helped to make this happen. Since users were getting blocked on 4chan, they turned to other places such as Ponychan, Fem Fiction, and Equestria Daily. These sites were focused around the show and the fandom, and had their arms wide open for fans who wanted to share their interest in ponies. Other non-pony sites were also seeing an increase in MLP traffic too. Funny Junk, Something Awful, DeviantArt, YouTube… It seemed that no website was safe from the My Little Pony phenomenon. Some web pages, like Memebase, even had to make additional sections just to contain all the pony content pouring in. On February 27th, 2011, the brief pony ban was lifted on Co. and on March 1st for B. There were strict rules put into place to manage the flow of pony-related fans, like keeping the post about ponies to one main thread, and to make sure the post actually had something to discuss instead of mindless spam. And on February 17th, 2012, almost a year following the ban, the MLP board was created on 4chan. Mood said that he apologized for the wait, and knew that My Little Pony fans needed their own board from the get-go. Yet at this point, Bronies had firmly established websites of their own to call home. Now despite the drama that occurred, 4chan had played a significant role in the growth of Bronies. I mean, heck, without 4chan, Bronies wouldn't even exist, or at least be as successful as they are today. But now their destiny as a fandom was in their own hands. 4chan, however, was just one of many conduits for people to discover My Little Pony. Whether it was a YouTube video or a forum post, MLP spread and eventually found its way to the desktop of future bronies. Hi! Ah! Ah! I had seen a couple of reaction pictures on one of the two or three times I've been to 4chan, and I thought they were cute. I didn't associate them with, like, a My Little Pony. I just thought they were a bunch of really funny-looking cartoon ponies. They started with joysticks seeing Fighting is Magic. And uh, it was just a really good looking game. Like it was really professionally done. The animation was great. I'm a big fan of 2D fighters like Street Fighter, King of Fighters, Guilty Gear. And it kind of had that, that flow, like really good flow, really good animation. It just looked really fun and balanced. Like wow, you know, this is pretty amazing that like people are doing this for a pony like franchise, like why? Uh, I was browsing Co, the image board of 4chan. And I happened to see some macros and some people linking uh, like I guess begin beginning of the whole fandom like PMV stuff really simple. It just sort of showed up in my RSS feeds. And there was this mashup, like a trailer mashup. I think it was the Starcraft one or the maybe Pony Effect two, and it was mashed up with Pony. We have Zerg attack waves incoming. Kerrigan, what's she after? She's come to finish the job. When I watched this, and I was like, hey, this 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 is really funny, and it's really well made. And it's well animated, the show. So this got me interested in what is this? What is this? Why does this have so many views? Why is this so well made? So I, I just started asking myself questions and I dove in, into this rabbit hole and I found out <laughs> that there's this show called My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. I was interested, but I didn't watch a show from that. I just kind of forgot about it again. Um, then a month later, I would just order something random off of eBay and it came wrapped in my little pony wrapping paper. And I was just like, oh yeah, that show, like it, was, it looked kind of cool. Specifically, I saw a video, I've been a fan of that guy with the glasses.com for a while, and um, and a video by CR, it was Pinkie Pie in five seconds. And I'd heard a little bit about um, about the show beforehand, but not much. Uh, and it was just a couple of goofy clips of Pinkie Pie being silly. And uh, in the comments were all, oh, it's, it's a good show. And so I, yeah, I went and watched it. Well, I was introduced to it uh, from a couple of friends of mine who uh, suddenly, you know, got really interested in it from uh, the beginning. I guess it was like about like halfway through the season and the conversation all turned to ponies and I was not understanding it whatsoever. I got into the fandom because my friend Brent, he's uh, going to college for uh, animation and he always knows like what's up with good animation and cartoons and stuff. And so he would always send me good stuff. And he sent me My Little Pony episode one and I thought it was a joke so I was like, ah, how funny Brent and I didn't watch it. And then uh, a couple days later he messaged me, he was like, did you watch it? And I was like, no. He's like, watch it. And I was like, are you serious? Watch it. Friend uh, said, Hey, you need to really watch this show. Come on, you need to watch this show. I uh, said, what show? Oh, My Little Pony. Okay. Week goes by, I don't watch it, obviously. And um, 
I noticed that all my friends, like all of my male friends' uh, pictures on Skype are now pony icons. So I was like, all right, you know what, I'll give it a try. And so it, you know, it caught my eye and it really interested me. So I just kept watching and, you know, soon I was hooked. Um, really? So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like all our artist friends say, this is great. We're going to watch it. So, okay. so we sat down and we watched the two-part premiere and went, okay, not bad. Let's watch some more. So by the time 4 a.m. rolled around, we were through Sound of Rain Boom and we were hooked. So they sent me videos, you know, they sent me all manner of pony media in order to try and, uh, you know, try and convert me and have me defect to the pony side. And um, so I decided to sit down with it. I watched uh, one episode, two episodes, five episodes. And uh, before you knew it, I was, you know, I was hooked. I, did, I, could, I can't even say that I rationalized it. It just sort of happened. It, it just intrigued me because I, I started looking at clips on YouTube and I saw like Sweetie Belle uh, singing Fluttershy's song from the um, Stairmaster episode. And I was like, this is, there's something going on here. This intrigues me and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I sort of naturally gravitate towards things that are just sort of kind of weird, kind of offbeat. And I, I just, I just, this looks like something really amazing. So I just started watching the episodes and, and one, two, three, four, five, six, twenty-six in like three days. And I was just hooked. I, I wasn't entirely all, oh, it's, 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 it's still for little girls. I don't know if I can like this. But then, uh, but then uh, the song in Winter Wrap Up, that was the first moment where I had to actually pause it and go back because out of nowhere, this impromptu, fantastic musical number comes up. But do you see? What does every pony do? How do I fit in without magic? I haven't got a clue. Winter wrap up, winter wrap up. Let's finish our holiday cheer. Winter wrap up, winter wrap up. Cause tomorrow spring is here. Cause tomorrow spring is here. There was a here. specific episode that I watched that kind of, I don't know, there was just a revelation. Um, you know, because I, I said, I, I, you know, I picked it up, I started watching episode after episode, and even halfway through the season, I was still a little skeptical. I didn't quite understand the phenomena. I thought, okay, it's a good show. Um, but believe it or not, it was actually um, my favorite episode, Party of One. Um, and for some reason, P Pinkie Pie's nervous breakdown, just like, I love the way it was animated, I love the way it was scripted, everything about it. And to me, the, it just, the quality of it was tremendous. And that's when I started to get like, there is something to this show. I'm having a delightful time as well. I'm so glad, Sir Lancelot. My dad's got my elf of a little slice of cake. Anything for you, Madame LaFlower. I'm just glad none of them ponies showed up. Oh, they're not so bad. And uh, I just got a big kick out of like the whole fact that they were mashing like things that were these colorful equine horses with like. Uh, Watchmen, well that, that was me eventually, but like just weird trailers and things like that and I thought it was like funny to take some like dark themed things and mesh it with like this really light-hearted child show. My father was a drinker and a fiend and one night he goes off crazier than usual. Mommy gets the kitchen knife to defend herself. He doesn't like that. Not one bit. So, me watching, he takes the knife to her, laughing while he does it. He turns to me and he says, Why so serious? And I asked him, you know, what's this from? And so he sends me a link to the pilot episode of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic off of YouTube and a link to the fanfiction cupcakes. So basically said have fun and didn't talk to me again and it wasn't until like a couple weeks after that that my sister was like have you heard of this like cupcakes thing my friend keeps sending it to me and so i read cupcakes and i just like this is bizarre but now i just for some reason that inspired me to go back and like watch the whole thing just so, like if someone can like write this something this like ridiculous like i gotta give it another shot and third time was a charm i just got totally addicted and in, like i think three days i just powered through everything and then I started watching online, and I found out that other people love this as well. And there was like hundreds and thousands of them. So okay, this is really interesting. Something is going on here. And so at some point, I just made this conscious decision. I, I want to see what this is, what this is all about, and where this is all going to go. So I just, I just thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into this fandom, and I'm going to be a part of this. 
and, and see where this will take me. And now I'm here giving an interview about it. <laughs> From amid in his article to the Pony Wars on 4chan, all of this commotion brought new people into the fandom. Spring 2011 basically marks the first growth spurt for bronies, though this increase in fans brought a change. After the flame wars ended on Ko and B, a good chunk of bronies sincerely believed in this philosophy of being open-minded and loving, and took phrases such as love and tolerate to heart. Many of these new bronies weren't around for the events on 4chan and got their start elsewhere. They didn't realize that the philosophy they were adopting was actually a quote used by spammers to antagonize critics. Yet this wave of fans, in their excitement, misunderstood the inside jokes from 4chan and turned love and tolerate into a mantra that has stuck with the fandom ever since. Although not every fan of My Little Pony shares his point of view. My Little Pony itself also played a role in this shift in direction. Some say that this is due to the lessons from the show and how they rubbed off on bronies. The morals weren't two-dimensional, and instead had profound characters having real problems and finding real solutions that might require them to face their fears or swallow their pride. Storytelling on this level was so well done that kids and parents could actually take something away from it, and that was the case for older fans too. Yet it's strange to look back at 4chan as the cradle for this fanbase. The site itself is no stranger to memes and subcultures, but one so opposite of its attitude is quite bizarre. But thanks to a passionate production team with a leader who had vision, My Little Pony was able to make a huge splash on the web and was very well received on television too. From early 2011 and on, the fanbase grew rapidly. My Little Pony began to spread to different sites, and people from all over the web started to hear about this group of older fans associated with it. Today, we stand among bronies and their fruition. A very healthy and numerous fandom now exists that is quite unique and unlike anything else. The irony itself is almost too much. I mean, older guys? Liking My Little Pony? Sounds like a bad joke. But this is the reality of the situation, and it continues to even grow more bizarre. Not only would these people watch the show, they would celebrate it. There was an influx of fan-made content that flooded the web alongside My Little Pony. Fans started to take their creativity to a much higher level, as the internet bore witness to Bernie's songs, art, and animation that soon made rounds across the fanbase. And in fall 2011, season 2 for My Little Pony began, and with it came a flood of new fans for the show. The timing was impeccable, since the hype for Brownies and My Little Pony was reaching many people on the web. So when the second season started, all of the old fans and the new ones converged at once, and the fanbase went through an enormous growth spurt that was much larger than the one that happened in spring earlier that year. Another increase also occurred in late April of 2012 with the season 2 finale for My Little Pony. These three moments in time mark the major spikes in growth for the Bernie fandom. There hasn't been a huge increase since the finale for Season 2, but there have been semi-large inclines, such as the beginning of Season 3. But how many older fans can there be statistically? It's hard to say. The majority of bronies watch the show online, and that is difficult to decipher as far as numbers go. There could be over 5 million bronies, or maybe just a few hundred thousand. No one can be 100% sure, but they have made their presence known. It's been a long and unexpected journey for My Little Pony, one that led to an unpredictable yet astonishing turn of events. Lauren's vision for Generation 4 raises the My Little Pony franchise to a new level of entertainment that is fun to watch, yet doesn't pander to its broad audience. But at the end of Season 2, Lauren resigned from Friendship is Magic and passed the torch of creative control to the capable and talented Megan McCarthy as the new story editor for the show. Regardless of this change of command, the majority of the staff remain and continue to dedicate the same effort that they put forth in the previous seasons of My Little Pony. Despite the history that has been covered so far, the question still remains and begs to be asked. Why? Why would such a dedicated community pop up around such a bizarre topic and sincerely latch onto it to this degree? There isn't an easy answer, but it most likely comes down to two main factors, timing and passion. Timing because the hype and chatter for the show happened at the perfect moment. Ten years ago, none of this would have been possible. The World Wide Web was not advanced enough at the time. But in 2010, the internet was more than capable to accommodate this rapidly growing fan base and provide the means for it to go viral. And passion, because the individuals who worked on My Little Pony Friendship is Magic overflowed with it. And that same passion was absorbed by their unorthodox fans and fueled the flames of growth on the internet. Lauren and her team were the key to unlocking not only the hidden potential within the My Little Pony franchise, but of thousands of others around the world. Inspiration was kindled, and artists unaware had found themselves not only creating, but sharing their work with a fandom that celebrates creativity. 
and also ponies. But this will be covered in part two of our documentary. There we will take a closer look into the colorful and creative driven world of the brony. Sunshine, celery stocks. <laughs>